Welcome to another episode of Purchase to Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. Our guest today got media coverage for his purchase of two buildings located in the historic district of his hometown. He fought through extensive renovations, going over budget and capital raising challenges, and still lived to tell the tale. Kyle Stevie joins us today. Kyle, welcome to Purchase to Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, I feel, no, I, I feel I remember, famous. My first podcast. <laughs> there, there you go. Everybody remembers remembers their first time. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. And uh, I'm really interested in these uh, historic uh, historic buildings uh, you, you got. So we'll uh, we'll be sure to get to those. Okay. Um, to kick things off, do you want to tell us uh, what your real estate goals are right now? Well, my real estate goals, are we talking long-term? Are we talking five years? Uh, let's, let's talk both. Let's start long-term and then we'll kind of go more uh, short-term. Okay. So my cousin and I, cousins and I, I apologize, started uh, Sparron Capital. It's uh, kind of an offshoot of his realty company already. That he has Sparron Real Estate. Okay. Sparron Realty, I apologize. And basically what we are doing right now, we're in the middle of creating our investor um, I guess, telephone book, whatever you want, directory. Yeah. Go old school. But the, uh, the, the idea is we want to have at least 300 to 400 accredited investors. Now, they don't have to be just our investors, but we need to have 300 to 400 people that we can say, hey, we've got this deal that we found on our own or through networking that they're looking for an equity raise that, you know, these, these are the numbers. This is what they're showing. This is what they project. Is this something you want to do? And then hopefully enter in general partnerships and syndications and things like that. Additionally, um, my cousin's really big into finding industrial land, which is okay. like finding Willy Wonka's golden ticket right now in Northern Kentucky, greater Cincinnati, everything. Well, there's not really much available and everything by the airport where everything's really available with land is a super expensive. So that's kind of where he's at on his, at his, his end of it. So we are trying to merge all of our ideas together to create the, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, give more options so that our clients can diversify their real estate portfolio, not just their whole entire investment portfolio. That's okay. a, that's the game plan. Okay. So personally, for me, I would love to do you know as many syndication deals as I can a year, person, and then for myself, buy uh, five to twenty unit apartment complexes in Northern Kentucky for my personal retirement. Mm -hmm. so that I don't have to rely on a 401k or social security. That's just like a fairy tale. They tell us about that. We just put 6% of our paycheck into until we reach the cap. Yeah. And then um, on the side too, I would like to get into um, a few more house flips okay. just to, uh, you know, for how does he, how does he put it? Pocket change. Yeah. Yeah. For the, the, the fun uh, spending money. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, like, you know how, how you're trying to grow your syndication business? Do, do you have any, any uh, have you set any goals in terms of, you know, I want to control this amount of dollar volume or I want to have so many units? Like, uh, have you thought that far yet? No. Um, I'm more along the lines of actual communities, I guess. Okay. So, uh, we're, you know, I'm in Joe Fairless's mentorship group. So he's consulting me. And the big thing with Joe is goal setting. You know, yeah. you shoot for the stars and maybe you land on the moon type of deal. Yeah. And so my, my goal for syndication was always, if I could do two, you know, 200 to 400 unit of deals a year, then I'm sitting pretty, right? And then everything else is just gravy. Yeah. And that's what I need to work towards. So that if, if I had an ultimate goal, it would be that. Like yeah. that's my baseline. But for me, I, I enjoy this. So I'll, even after deal two for the year, I'm looking for deal three, deal four, because it's just much more enjoyable than sitting around, on, I mean, sitting behind a desk doing what I, I mean, I love my company. I love what I do now, but I'd, I'd love to have a little bit more free time, you know? Oh, no, 100%. Yeah, this is going to provide that for me. That's the goal anyway. But for sure. So do you have any routines now that, uh, that you do to keep the, that goal top of mind? Uh, well... Basically, I guess I do what everybody else does. It's just starting, you know, you, you go and go to LoopNet, look at deals just for fun. 
and try to run numbers to see if this would be a good purchase, not a good purchase. Do these, not, do these fall in to the certain guidelines you have for the property in terms of age and condition? And then uh, I try to reach out and meet with at least two guys a week that are in real estate some sort, some way. So for example, I'm meeting tomorrow morning for coffee with a friend of mine who just started his own um, development company. He's been, uh, he was a partner at a development company for a long time. He does, he's, he's uh, you gotta kind of understand greater Cincinnati. He, he's been really big in Newport and Bellevue, which are two cities in Northern Kentucky right across the river from Cincinnati. And so he's, de he's helped develop a, there was an apartment complex you have to know the city to understand it. But he's, he's been a good sounding board, especially when I was doing the buildings in Fort Thomas. And I try to meet with as many accredited investors as I can so that I can get them on my list. And then I actually, one of the most interesting meetings I, I had was with a uh, guy who runs a venture capital fund here in greater Cincinnati. Just to hear him how he gets deals pitched to him daily, right? Not real estate deals, but just like anything that's a startup is coming to his group because they need capital. So he all like his, he goes, you got 30 seconds. If I don't have interest in your project in 30 seconds, I'm back on my phone. I'm twiddling. I cannot wait for you to get out of my office. And that was kind of like my thought process was like, wow, there's no rebounding from that first 30 seconds. He mm -hmm. goes, Nope. I said, all right, better come with the punchline first, I guess. Yeah, hundred percent. So let's get into these uh, these uh, two deals in the uh, downtown area of uh, what Port, Port Saint Thomas, Thomas Port Thomas. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell us about um, you know like how how did these even come like come to your attention? All right. So to understand the deals, this is kind of like our civic. This was our my partner's eyes civic duty because we sure didn't make as much money as we thought we were going through all of it. <laughs> To understand the deal is you kind of have to understand Fort Thomas. Okay. Um, Fort Thomas is in Campbell County, which is right, like I said, right across from Cincinnati. It is, uh, it's got the best school district in the state. It's a very affluent neighborhood, very affluent area. It's got about 18,000 people in it. So it's a bedroom community. There's an industry there. Is, there aren't any factories or any, um, uh, you know, industrial parks or anything anywhere near it. And, what happens in Fort Thomas is that for whatever reason, people have a hard time supporting the local businesses because when they want to go out, they want to go out to different neighboring cities. Mm -hmm. So we came, my wife wanted to build an addition on our house and I'm 100% commissioned at my job. And this is when we got really got into real estate. I thought there's absolutely zero chance that I will enjoy this addition stressed out about my job and how much more this is going to cost to, you know, my monthly payments. I want someone else to pay for it. So I, you know, this is even before reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it was just reading through, um, there was a book, multiple streams of income or something or like that. And then they were talking about real estate and I, my cousins that I've been in it. So I decided that, you know, I'm just going to go for it. And so we started looking for properties and less than a mile from our house, my wife had driven by on taking our daughter to school and she saw the two buildings were for sale which is not an off market deal, which generally is not the way you want to go. But I decided to look into it with my part, my neighbor who was a contractor. Um, he had never done commercial before. All of his stuff had been residential like flips and historic homes in Newport and Covington, but same, same type of deal. So we looked at the buildings. I knew exactly what area they were. Um, it's called the Midway District. And it was a business district that was built when they moved the fort from the barracks. It was actual military barracks from Newport up into Fort Thomas because of elevation and the, the barracks in Newport flooded all the time. So all these buildings have been built. All these businesses have been built to accommodate the soldiers that live there. Well, they've gone to crap, man. I'm allowed to say that. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We, we've had a lot worse on the show. <laughs> So. so the lady that owned these two buildings had died five years prior to the buildings being listed and she died and tested. So there was, there was no like sign signal. There was no direction how to disperse the properties. It was in probate. And while it was in probate, I mean, she kept it like section eight. It was gross before she died. It was, they call it, it was really like, I would say 80% of the police calls came from those two buildings. Oh, they were like, they're so far out of place for, for Fort Thomas. It was ridiculous. 
and it really drugged that they really drugged down that that side of that strip because Midway's district's not a big it's only like three blocks and they're all on one side and basically the you know you had this element that was living in these apartments that were on ground floor and it was just it was not conducive to having an entertainment district so I knew the buildings I knew what they were like before she had died I knew she was another building had been part of the same estate and they had renovated that. I knew how many dumpsters it had taken to get that, those, that, that building taken out. But, you know, we, we, we negotiated and we got a good price for it. So we thought we were set. We didn't foresee things happening the way they happened. Yeah. Well, this is interesting because, you know, you just, you decided to go for it, which is great. Uh, your wife drives by, she, she sees these two properties you have no experience in flipping and this sounds like a pretty heavy, a heavy project. Um, but, but you kept going with it. So what did you do next? <laughs> well, so we made our first offer in April and I think they wanted three fifty five for both of them. And we're like, no, we, first of all, when we went in, we went out without electricity because electricity hadn't been on in five years. Oh, oh, okay. So whatever we could see in certain rooms with the, light from our cell phone is what we were going off of. So we knew there was water damage. We knew that one of the roofs was going to have to definitely be replaced. Another one was going to need to be repaired. We thought we could save the hardwood floor and most of it because we had pulled the carpet up, but we knew there's some spots that needed to be fixed. And so we went in, um, I, like I said, my, my neighbor was my, who's my partner what is a contractor. So we went off of his numbers. So we, we offered it like 110, wound up settling at 155. The issue is every time you counter offer when it's in probate, it's got to, you're relying on, sorry, you're relying on the attorney that's in the, that's handling the estate to take that offer to the a judge. The judge has to approve it or it goes back and it gets rejected. That takes two weeks. It's awful. Yeah. So we waited, waited, waited. Finally in June, they accept the offer. Um, we met at like 155 for the two buildings, which at, at, if we would have stayed there with our projected renovations would have been awesome. We were looking at netting about 900 to $1,000 a piece on them per month, which, you know, for a first time gig, <laughs> yeah, pretty nice. Well, the issue arise that uh, the, they found there wasn't clear title, which was weird because they had already sold the one property that I mentioned before that wasn't the one we were buying, but was still part of the same estate. Mm -hmm. So they, we couldn't get clear title and the attorney that was handling it wouldn't go. Oh, oh, so uh, I'm, I'm an attorney, so I don't practice, but I went to law school and I'm a member of the Kentucky and Ohio bar. I know very, I remember very little real estate class. One of the things I do remember is that all you have to do with potential heirs is publicize in their local media and they had like 28 days to respond. It's all he had to do. And he refused to do it. I even saw him, this is why I mentioned I'm an attorney. I saw him uh, walking down the street um, from his office to a restaurant to eat. And I was driving and I was like, I should probably confront him. And I drove a couple blocks and I was like, no, I can't do it. He's with people. And then I thought to myself, I was like, don't be a coward. You're not going to be, you know, you're not going to fist fight the guy. Just go con confront him. He's not doing his job. Just tell him what he's, you know, because we already had a offers. We had our contract signed. Chris was holding off um, a certain job, so we, had, so we had his crew ready to do these buildings. So finally, I go into the restaurant, and I confront him. I'm like, hi, my name's Kyle Stevie. Uh, we're with KCCA, and the two buildings that you're representing in this probate case, we need you to start moving faster. And he said, well, I don't have to move anything because the other properties sold with clear title. And I said, I don't care. All I know is that all you have to do is send out publication to the potential heirs because they weren't kids. They weren't her children. They were like great nieces and nephews. Mm -hmm. And they're like oh, Florida, Colorado, they're all over the country. And he refused to do it. Well, the thing is he's a defense attorney. So he, th he took this probate case, three buildings and four Thomas where people are wanting to get into. And he thought this is going to be easy. No problem. I'll disperse this property with investors. I'll buy this property. No problem. Yeah. So once he realized that he had to do some work, he was just, he wouldn't do it. So finally, I, I happened to know the guy who bought the house. Um, and I said, how did you guys get clear title? 
He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, our buildings are the same as stated as your building. And we can't get clear title because there are potential errors that can contest the sale. So he went to his attorney. His attorney realized that he screwed up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, and then they, so they went back and they said, yeah, you've got to rectify this now. And so now he's got, okay, there's another thing you kind of have to know about Fort Thomas. There are people that are bigger names than me here. And he's the, the, guy, the, the gentleman who bought this house was a much bigger name than I was. And so the ball got rolling a lot faster. So that was, that was, that was how we got started. In the meantime, while we're doing all this, we have two tenants that uh, potential businesses that want to come in. They contacted our Renaissance committee here in the city. And so they had set us up. And so we're negotiating leases while we're waiting for this building to come. come. So I'm thinking, Oh my God, this is a gold mine. This is perfect. I'm going to get this building. We're going to flip them up. We're going to white box them. These businesses are going to move right in. We're going to have everything up and running where we start making money in eight months. And it's just, that's what you get from being cocky, right? Yeah, oh, for, for sure. So um, let's, we'll move on to what happened during the renovation. So at this point, did you feel that you had done your underwriting um, properly? Or do you think you could have, or based on what you knew at the time and your experience, did, did you feel that you were set in terms of underwriting and were confident with the numbers? <laughs> Underwriting. I didn't even know what underwriting was. Oh. <laughs> I had no clue. I mean, until I got into Joe's program, I was like underwriting. I'm like, I, to me, that's like a CPA doing some sort of accounting thing, you know? Yeah. I'd run, we had run numbers. We were like, we figured that it was going to cost uh, about $180,000 to fix both buildings up. Uh, we were going to charge X amount per square footage. Uh, we have a two apartments above uh, what's now an ice cream shop. So we we're like, we're going to, we're going to make some serious money on this. So that in terms of underwriting, that's about the extent that we did. We didn't do, and we, we thought we did due diligence, but you know, you can only see so much in the dark. Oh, for, for sure. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk about the renos. So okay, what, uh, what, what happened with, uh, with those? All right. So a lot of things happened with the renovations. So like I said, when we got to go see the buildings, we got to see them in the dark. We knew we needed, we knew that the city said that they can no longer have the apartments on the ground floor. We knew that. That's why we were negotiating with the businesses. Uh, for one of the businesses, we were going to have to put a fire block between on the, at the ceiling or for the business is going to be on the ground floor apartments on top. We thought that's all we were going to need to do. We thought that by, you know, we were going to have to, we were going to be able to keep the pine floors in the apartments. We were just going to save ourselves money and flooring. Um, we took out like 20 dumpsters full of just stuff. I mean, you saw the pictures. People still had stoves and everything in there when we got in there. I mean, we found one shoe. Like why? Like, it wasn't like an old brand shoe. It was a newer brand. Like some squatter just left with one shoe on. This was just like weird stuff like that. So we got through there. Uh, so 1013 is, a, is the two story with the apartments on top. They had uh, just, just an example. We exposed the, we, we, expo we take, we knock out the drop ceiling and now we say we got 15 foot ceiling. Beautiful. Great. Cause it's gonna be an ice cream parlor. Yeah. We have a steel column in the middle and it's round and it's nice. And it's like perfect. It's like a throwback to historic building. We could do tile floor. It's going to be awesome or a checkerboard floor or whatever to make it look like an ice cream shop. Then we go to the back and they expose that one. That was wood. And not only was it wood, it was bowed. Like literally how the back of the building didn't fall down. I have yeah. no idea. We had to replace, obviously I had to replace that. We had to replace, I forget how many, um, how many, uh, gosh, the, 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 the flooring, the joists. I forget how many joists we had to replace. Uh, we just, it was crazy. And then on top of that, the cost of materials started going up from 2016 to 2017. So that part of the projection kind of got blown out. Yeah. Did, did you end up having any uh, engineering reports or inspections done before you closed? Uh, no. Next time we will. <laughs> no, we, it was in, it, they were as is purchases. Yeah. So like that's, it was kind of take it or leave it. Yeah. No, I, I'm just asking uh, even ju just to give yourself. So I, I think if you were to do that again, um, just so even though they were as is, where is, um, you know, just so you knew what you were getting into 
um, just having those professionals go in before you close, at least you'd have a better scope of, uh, of work, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I thought, and my neighbor felt confident when he went in there. It wasn't like there was any wavering with him that he knew what he was looking at because he yeah. had looked at so many houses in Newport. Yeah, next time there will definitely be we'll, – we'll, we'll lay out a little bit more money towards actually having the prep ready as yeah. opposed to just going in and going hog wild and realizing, oh, my God, yeah. we're so far over budget right now. Yeah, for, for sure. So, so you had to do a whole bunch of work, um, and then – you went over like the, the budget was an issue. Oh yeah. Budget still an issue. Um, so like I said, we were negotiating with tenants. We thought all we had to do was white box it. Yeah. And then the tenants would pay for the rest and we were just going to do it all at the same time. So, you know, there was no reason for us to drywall it and then have their electrician come in and punch holes in the drywall and run and snake things. Well, um, the one fell through the lease, the, you know, I, the, it, let's just say the negotiation was very slow. Um, I was, we were way too nice. We should have had some earnest money put down before we even started negotiating with him. He was coming, but he kept coming by every day to check on the, the demo. And we're like, okay, he's going to sign. He's going to sign any day now. And he never did. And we gave him a lease and he said, well, I have to be up and running by this date. And we're like, well, we just talked to you three weeks ago. You didn't say anything about time is of the essence on this. Yeah. He said, well, I got to, I have a huge contract that I got to fulfill. I said, okay, well, let's just, you're on a month to month lease where you're at now. Let's just push this back here, but let's sign. He said, I don't know. I don't know. And then we met May, uh, like beginning of May, he said, this is what my, this is, uh, he gave me a bullet, bullet points of everything he had changed from our lease, just so we were prepared. And he said, my attorney will send the official red lines to you tomorrow. Two days later, I got them. But in the meantime, I sent them to my attorney and he looked at it and he said, are you sure you want this guy as a tenant? Because I've done a ton of leases. What he's asking for is kind of, he's going to be really tough to deal with, man. Mm -hmm. And so I said, yeah, I mean, we need to get people in there because we need to start making money. So he uh, comes back and he sends his, his attorney sends his uh, revisions. And I look at it and it's nothing that we discussed. So two hours of my life sitting with this guy, talking on the street about everything he wanted to see changed in the lease. And like three things had been addressed and he changed like all these different things. And I'd had enough. I was like, forget it. We've already been too nice. So I said, Don, this is it. Take it or leave it. And um, he said, well, that's it, then I'm leaving it. I was like, that's fine. I thought there were other businesses coming in behind them. Yeah. And we, we showed it to like three or four different people, but it just didn't, it didn't happen. And then, uh, so that was money that we were losing at the very beginning of the reno. So we had budgeted in having those leases ready to rock and roll, you know, six to seven months into the renovations and they just weren't there. And then on top of that, we went over, um, with the, the cost of what it caught, we had to actually fire block the floor of the apartments up top as well to get the code that cost a lot more money than we thought. Cause now we have to pay not only for the fire blocking, we have to pay for the flooring up there. Um, I'm trying to think of all the other things we went over. So I had, and this is my fault. I had no idea how far over we were. I was under the impression that we we're like 50,000 going to be probably about $50,000 over. I was going to, eat it and just, you know, take it out of my 401k that ever says you don't do, but you know, I gave my word. I was going to get this done. This is what I'm going to do. And it was during, uh, I was watching the Steelers and the Bengals play and he called, I called up my partner and I said, uh, cause we were negotiating a second lease on the 1011 South four times. And I said, she wants us to do this and this. Oh, we can't do that. I said, why? He goes, cause we're like hundred thousand dollars over budget. And I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> Hold on, man. I got, I, so I, I, I said, so I got to go. So I hung up the phone and I just sat there and felt like somebody just punched me right in the stomach. Like I felt like I was about to throw up. <laughs> so I was like, all right, <laughs> this sucks. So I went to, uh, I went back to the uh, visionary, the, the, sorry, the Renaissance committee. And I said, do you have anybody that could help us get more funding? And they said, well, you can try these people. So I went to, we're right by Northern Kentucky University and they have a small business association. Is that my train or your train? Oh, I, I don't hear a train. 
Oh, then it's mine. Sorry. Okay. Um, the, uh, so there's small business association. So we went, we, I met with them and they turned me on to, uh, it's called pace financing. And so what that is basically is a, um, it's, it's a loan for energy improvements, but it, it's actually a tax. So it goes onto your county tax and it's a write off. Um, you don't pay monthly payments. You pay it at the end of the year with your county tax bill. So um, we were able to get that done to uh, bridge what we owed and the bank worked with us too. The bank was awesome. Um, United, they really helped us out because they didn't want to see the project fail either. It's part of the beauty of being with a community bank, right? They're like, yeah, we see you doing the work. You guys are idiots. You're way over budget, but we're going to, you know, we're going to get this done. Yeah. <clears throat> so he, uh, um, the guy, the guy at Pace came and he said, well, here's how Pace works for us to get approval to work in your County. We have to go through the fiscal court. Otherwise every municipality would have to uh, approve the financing. So we had to wait to go through the County, um, fiscal court, which we're supposed to happen. This is in November when I meet with them, we're supposed to have the money in March. We didn't get it till May. And that was kind of, a, it was kind of a few sleepless nights. And then, yeah. so I like the, I could quickly see all my money just going and to make the matters worse, personally speaking, is that I didn't think these billions would ever go through because the, the attorney was like for two months, wasn't answering anybody's phone calls. And even after I spoke with him, he didn't talk to anybody for like a month and a half. So I bought a multi, I bought a duplex in a neighboring city. So that's $15,000 down payment right there. Mm -hmm. And then these came, I was like, so all of a sudden I'm like $50,000 out of my emergency fund gone. Yeah, it was awful. So yeah, we went over budget. Yeah. It impacted so, me. Yeah. Th th this is, this is a really good story. Even though like as you were going through it, it didn't feel very good. This is a good learning experience for other people. Um, yeah. j just in terms of, you know, systems you need to have in place when you're uh, looking at properties, underwriting, um, you know, getting people in there before so you know what to do, financing, keeping track of your budget and all that stuff. So like, how have, how have you changed how you look at property because of this? Oh, well, two things. Um, totally hold to the axiom. Do not fall in love with a piece of real estate. Yeah. Uh, second thing is that I've gone completely engineer geek on this. If it does, if the numbers don't work, then the numbers don't work. Move on, find something else. Because mm -hmm. even though we bought, we got lucky, right? Because we bought right. If we would have bought this at market or just below market, we would have been we have been upside down. I mean, we're cash flowing positively. Mm -hmm. We would have been, um, yeah, we would have definitely, <laughs> we had definitely been in deep doo doo if we'd have if we did not bought the bought right. Mm -hmm. So in that aspect, we kind of, I mean, it was generic underwriting, but we kind of did do our numbers somewhat correctly. We left ourselves enough cushion, but yeah, I'll never, ever, if it's uh, like, if, the, depending on what it is, like the 70% after market value, after repair value, that's if I were to do flips, I would hold to that. Anybody, no more reinventing the wheel, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. If everybody's got, if there are these different ratios, and smart people are clinging to these ratios and smart people are making a lot of money doing this. There's absolutely no reason to think that you're smarter than any, everybody else because you're not. And I never thought I was smarter. I just needed to make the mistakes on my own. And that's kind of what we did. Mm -hmm. So at, at this point, are you with these two properties, have you been able to do a refi to put some longer term debt on them or where, where are you at right now? Well, we had to escalate our leases um, to kind of entice the businesses in. So one of the businesses is coming into year two. So their lease price will go up about $125 a month. And then the, and in, in October, no, sorry, August, I apologize. The other business will go up about 150. So that'll give us 250 more dollars a month. Where we're at with financing, we, I don't think that we would qualify for any more for a refi because of the pace financing being, um, I think they got, they see the thing is with that too. And this is why you have to have a bank work with them. They take first position. Mm. So that's why some banks will be very hesitant to use it because you know, if anything screws up, they're going to get paid first and the bank's getting paid second. Yeah. So I don't think we're not right now in a position that it would make sense for us to go in when we get like 80% of the market value. 
is what we could refinance up to. Yeah. And we, I, I don't see, I just don't see it because we still owe right at about 80% just under it. So there's, yeah, there's no refinance right now, but like I said, we're positively cash flowing, um, playing catch up, but we're, we're able to catch We're I think we're making enough that we'll be able to catch up. But, and by the end of the year, uh, I feel like we're going to have enough money to help an emergency fund build up for each building. Mm-hmm. Even though everything's kind of brand new, which you still don't know. You still want to have the rainy day fund. And then, sure. from there, and then from there, we'll be able to start taking money, I guess, ourselves. Yeah. And, and what's your game plan? Um, like, are you guys looking to hold these for, you know, the next five, 10 years? Like, what's your strategy for that? Well, the city is in the middle of doing a, a visionary uh, a revisioning committee is what it's called. I was in the land use and zoning subcommittee and there's a park right across the street that where the fort used to be. It's, it's still the fort. They still have army reserves there, but the city uh, in the seventies bought a lot of land from the army and from the U S government. And so it's a pretty big regional. I mean, when I say regional, I mean, Northern Campbell County attraction for people to come there. Are a lot of, there used to be like world-class mountain bike trails back there. So you can run and it's the, on the hillside goes right down to the Ohio river. Um, they have a lot of other stuff that they want to bring in to bring, to make it more regional as opposed to just re- Northern Campbell County. They haven't actually like the greater Cincinnati regional attractions there. And if that happens, then, you know, it, it can only help the businesses that are in our buildings and make our apartments more, uh, more desirable. I mean, they're nice. We, we, we did the apartments, right. We're getting above market rents on them. Mm-hmm. But I think that, that, that we're kind of in a holding pattern right now trying to see what exactly the city has planned for, the, for right across the street. Gotcha. Or, I mean, we're, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, you know, you guys did up the buildings nice. So how has that changed the dynamic of that downtown area? Like, has it had a big impact on the community? Uh, yeah, it has. Um, funny thing about Fort Thomas is there's actually two downtown communities uh, there was the fort, which where Midway is, where all the soldiers live. And then there was uh, the Highlands, which was basically the city where all the town folk and some farmers and people lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So they both, they built two separate like business districts and they're, they're like a mile apart. So there's not like a continuous uh, small town America type strip like they have where I went to college in Hanover, Indiana and Madison, Indiana is absolutely beautiful. It's like eight blocks, just these exactly how you picture middle America, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful, like brick buildings with stores and sole proprietorships and all this other stuff. There's not that there. So what it's done is it's solidified, in my opinion, the entertainment aspect of Midway. Cause I always thought Midway was more of an entertainment district. Anyway, it's always kind of been like the bar sports bar, you know, restaurant type place they've had, uh, Fort Thomas pizza has been around forever there. The old Fort pub's been there. I mean, you get the names, right? Uh, Midway, the cafe was, was purchased. It's been there forever, but it was purchased three years ago by, um, uh, a group from the West side of Cincinnati and they came in totally fixed it up. They it's off. That is the corner. That's the anchor there. And it's awesome. So our building's right next door to that. Mm-hmm. If you go up to the district, before our buildings, it was like dark, dark, gazillion people at Midway. And then, you know, a little dark because there's another apartment complex. And then there was this, it wasn't, there wasn't any continuity. So now you, you have three businesses right by each other and it's made it pretty cool. So yeah. what it's done, what it's done is it's, it's, it's brought a little bit more vibrance, I would say. Yeah. Just because it gives you more options. So people aren't just, it's not a destination place anymore, right? It's like a, it's a district. You go there, you don't park just to eat at one place. You park to uh, walk around and hang out and say, okay, so Midway's packed, Old Fort Thomas pub. I don't want to go in there yet. I want to eat something first. Let's go to Fort Thomas pizza or our place. Uh, the, the bar runs in our building, grassroots and vine. Let's go there and eat. So that's, it's, it's made it, um, it's given us a little, I don't know different they're giving us a little strip where we people can go and eat something that they can't get somewhere else so it's yeah. giving it a little bit more life for sure i'll answer and uh so how has getting involved in in these two uh buildings changed your life uh for the good and, and the bad 
Um, well, I mean, I'm in a stressful job anyway, so extra stress didn't bother me at all. I mean, it, 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 I felt like I didn't know how we were going to do it, so that stressed me out. But once I figured out the answer, I was okay. I figured it would work itself out. I just want to do this. What it's done for me is it's made my appetite even, like, even more insatiable. Like I see the potential there. I've already screwed up. I've already messed up. I've burnt my, my hand, right? Yeah. But I know the stove's hot and I know it's cooking something good. So I want to eat. I just got to use a spatula instead of my hand on the egg, right? <laughs> that, that's a good analogy. <laughs> so that's kind of like, that's, that's, that's my, that's my thought process. It's like, I, I really, really, uh, I, I, what it really did too, cause I'm 38. So it sped up my thought process. Like I, I, I can't just think in, you know, 10 uh, in, in two uh, duplex or in single family or I need something big. I need to start making more money. If I'm going to go through this and I'm going to give myself an ulcer. I better be doing it for something that's going to make a lot of money at the, at the end. Right. Like yeah. that's the only way to do it. That's the only reason to take the risk on, but it also in terms of just like education and uh, interest in real estate, it's helped tremendously. Yeah. Like I have, I've learned, I, I've learned that I absolutely love learning about real estate. I love talking, listening to people talk about real estate. I mean, I love listening to people on podcasts. I read all the time. And, uh, I mean, you know, I joined Joe's group. It wasn't cheap. It was money worth well spent. And I, and when I did it, I, I told him and he, he was like, that makes perfect sense. I said, even if I never ever am good enough with investors or if I'm never good enough to find the deal off market and negotiate the way that I'm supposed to do it. This is a college education club course for me. This is, this is like going back to Hanover and taking real estate because in syndication, because I've learned so much just from that program about how to run numbers, but how to look how you know, about how to actually look inside of a, st- a statistical area and see, you know, which mark, which, which sub market you want to go into and just being able to um, identify correct properties it's just it's been worth it so that's what that's the way i looked at it and i'll continue to do that for sure and and even i i'd suggest that getting involved in those two buildings was like a doctorate in uh, real estate because <laughs> you learn the most from your mistakes right oh yeah i got a yeah. i got a ton of mistakes i hope i hope anybody listening to this is able to say you know that guy's an idiot but <laughs> i like i i'm not going to make that same mistake again yeah. But you know what though, uh, with all those mistakes, you took action on it and you actually did something in real estate where lots of people just hang back and they'll never do their first deal. Oh yeah. Um, and like I said, I did actually did three deals in the first month because I didn't think the one week, one deal was going to work out. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's great. Well, Kyle, just want to say thanks so much for, uh, for sharing your, uh, your real estate stories with us today. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. Perfect. And uh, where can people find you if they're looking for some more information? Um, right now, Sparing Capital is in the process of working on our website. Yeah. And if they want to reach out to me, I'm at Stevie Properties LLC at gmail.com. Right now, that's where I'm at. But uh, if you'd be so kind, once we get our website up and running, if I could tag it to you. For sure. To you, whatever. If you just publicize it a little bit, I really appreciate it. Perfect. No problem. Well, thanks again for your time. And uh, to you, our viewers, I wish you well in your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.